All right, everybody, this 10-minute talk here is actually the second half of a conversation I had with Nick Loffenberg that started out as the effects that canting your rifle can impart on your accuracy downrange and then morphed into how do you actually go about properly leveling your rifle scope when you mount it up on your rifle. And it may not be what the internet has told you, so tune in here, listen for the next 10 minutes, and hear what Nick has to say about that. It's interesting stuff. Speaking of leveling reticles to the earth, plum, actions, we have a lot of things we mount a rifle scope to a gun that in theory, should be level to one another, right? Or, or level to something. And so some people ask, you know, should you do the bubble level on the top of the action, then a bubble level on the scope, level the rifle, then level the scope? Some people say, you know, no, you might as well just be leveling it blind, you know, if you do that. If you're not using a plum or a plum bob in front of the rifle scope to level your rifle or your scope to the earth, then mm-hmm. you might as well not even worry about it at all. Um, and I, I know I've heard schools of thought from, from both arenas, like for people who are just shooting around at a hundred yards, you could, you can mount your scope probably 45 degrees. It's not going to matter sure. that much. You can still get it zeroed in and shoot just fine. Yep. You know, but for a lot of folks that are shooting maybe the more long range precision stuff, they get real, they get real kind of psyched out about how level. Yeah. Are. And, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, there, there's actually some guys like shooting F class that will intentionally can't their scope on their rifle yeah. because when they shoulder their rifle they know that they're inducing a little bit of can't when they're naturally their natural point of aim where their shoulder sits in the pocket of their sh- mm-hmm. or their buttstock sits in the pocket well until somebody makes a rifle where you can get inside of the stock <laughs> and you you don't have to have your face laying over it yeah well know, like my mdt side. chassis actually the buttstock will rotate to accommodate for oh. every individual shooter. That's one of the reasons That's why cool. I like chassis for competition is that I can formulate that rifle to fit my body and that when I get into a natural position, it's easier for me to be naturally plumb. Um, but yeah, you can you can actually cant your your optic on your action and still be take be accurate shooting without having to worry about this simply because as long as your reticle is level when you're shooting, that's the important thing. Um, okay. That's why when I set up a rifle, I, I will usually default if like I'm doing it for a customer. I'll, I'll level the reticle to the action just for simplicity's sake. If somebody picks it up and wants to check it, they can see that, yeah, okay, they, he leveled the gun right. Um, when I'm doing my own, though, I will shoulder the rifle, get into a position where I know that the rifle is settled into my body, where I'm comfortable, and then I will put the, uh, the rifle scope on, level out the reticle based on how I'm behind the rifle. Oh. And then I will put my bubble level on to correspond to my reticle so that if I'm behind my rifle, all I have to do is reference my bubble level real quick. I can see that I am level. And yeah, it just helps me. And that's a bubble level around the scope tube, right? Yeah. So you're not doing one that's on the pick rail of the gun, for example, because that doesn't necessarily. Correct. Yeah. Um, That's one of the reasons why I like a bubble level on the tube is that I have the adjustability range. I can move it according to where it's supposed to be for my setup. Um, If you put one on the rail, it does work as long as you have leveled the scope to the rail. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah, because then you can reference that quick. Because then you can quick reference. Yeah. Man, that is that is pretty wild. Because we get asked, or I see it asked all the time, and arguments going around from people all over the place about how you should properly level yeah. a rifle scope, and it 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 makes sense because in theory. So let's say let's say for example, and tell me if I'm crazy or if I'm wrong or whatever, but let's say you were always 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 going to be shooting on a hill, mm-hmm. like perpendicular with the hill or whatever shooting along it and so you're going to be way canted over to the right yeah and you knew that every time you're going to shoot you're going to be like that one might actually put up a plum downrange or something like that get behind the gun and actually mount their scope so that the scope was up and down properly level yeah. when the, everything was canted way off to the right whereas then if you went up straight again you'd see wow this scope's super cockeyed over to one side mm-hmm it wouldn't necessarily matter because when you're actually shooting the reticle, as long is, as you level, level the reticle, yeah, as long huh. as that that vertical stadia is moving parallel to the force of gravity, that's all that matters. Okay, so when you are, let's say, get rid of my hypothetical situation that was a little bit. Uh, I don't know if <laughs> so anybody could actually see the way it was working out in my brain. In my brain, it made. I sense. think I figured it. <laughs> uh, anyway, but now remove that. Let's say you have 
leveled your scope in a normal way, right? Like yeah. you're laying on a flat surface, you level your scope the way that you were explaining it, where you got behind the gun, you leveled it almost, you almost leveled it to yourself. Correct. Um, now when you're in any shooting situation, hunting competition, whatever, and you do find yourself cockeyed, mm-hmm. right? Like you're on that hill, you're on a stump, you're on a barricade. Do you go about then trying to manipulate manipulate your the way you're holding the rifle or your head or you know how the bipod is set up or whatever to try and get the reticle level or are you oh, doing yeah. something else to so you're always on in any shooting situation making sure that reticle is level so it might mean getting a little bit Sometimes I can imagine you'd have to get out of almost your normal shooting position. So right? one of the things that I, I guess I strongly recommend with anybody who's shooting, especially using a bipod, is pre-setting up that bipod so that you have enough uh, tension in it so that it doesn't move unless you intentionally move it. But it's it's loose enough that you can force it to move mm-hmm. uh, without it doing huge jumps and change. Um you know, if I'm shooting in one position, maybe I'm shooting on an uneven hillside, and then uh, I have my bipod set up so I'm I'm plumb with gravity, and then I go to the next stage, and my bipod is still set up that way, and all of a sudden I get on the gun, and I can see that okay, well I'm canted a ton. That's because my bipod was set up from where I was before. I need yeah. to be able to be able to move that quickly, yeah, and be able to move it accurately. Um, the uh, bipods I'm using right now are really smooth adjustment and uh, really. I guess easy to use and easy to manipulate when you're under stress, um, but yeah, that is super simple. Super simple to be able to just correct that when you're using something like a bubble level, and, and that's why I strongly recommend them. So you must be referencing your bubble level all the time. Less than you might think, though. Okay. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I set my rifles up the way I do, so that when I get into a natural, comfortable position, I know that I'm going to be pretty level. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm doing a super long range shot, because the more can't you introduce and the further the distance is, because if you if you actually think of it less in distance, but more of in the amount of adjustment you make. So let's say I'm shooting at 500 yards with my six Creedmoor and compare that to my dope with my 22 long rifle. Yeah. Obviously, I'm going to be dialing a lot more with my 22 long rifle, yeah. but that can't is going to matter more because I have dialed more elevation adjustment into the scope with the 22. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. think of it less in distance and bigger, more Bigger more as, angles. They have yeah. more time to proliferate over longer distances. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Huh. That's yeah. interesting. Same thing with doing holdovers. If you weren't dialing your scope and you're holding over the target, um, that is one of the benefits of a holdover, actually, because you can see your cant a little bit easier. If you're dialed and you're holding center, it's harder to see where you canted. Because you're on one pinpoint spot rather than exactly. being on like a vertical line. Yeah, or you're not it's looking at your crosshairs to... floating over your target because, you know, oh, okay, I can I can see the center of my crosshairs is to the right of my target. I need to camp my gun back over. Okay. You can't see that as well when you're dialed. I'd still like to dial for most of my shots because I find it to be a little bit more precise, but uh, that is one of the downsides of it. Yeah. Now, do you have uh, what what scopes do you have a bubble level on? Do you have a bubble level on every scope? Like even your hunting guns, do you have it on? I'm I'm trying to think like at what point should somebody really be worried about the, all this can't stuff? Because I've I've shot without a bubble level or even thinking about this can't because I didn't I literally. I'm learning as we're talking here myself, and I've shot okay enough that I've had fun doing it. You know, I've shot a deer, all that stuff. Um, like, what kind of people do you suggest really start getting hyper-focused on this? And what what person might be like, not as it's not as much of a necessity? It's less of a necessity if you're shooting in at closer ranges. Um, yeah. For a hunter, shooting inside of 300 yards, bubble level is almost not necessary. Because if you're canting your gun enough where it's going to throw off your, your target or your uh, point of impact you are canning the hell out of your rifle, and you can see it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there's another example is the monitor down. So the other the other uh, one I included here was actually shooting my 6.5 Creedmoor at um, uh, one mile. And oh, okay. at one mile, my deflection with a two-degree cant, which is still within the realm of possibility if you're not having something physically to reference, um, two-degree cant would throw me my point of impact off uh, horizontally by 58 inches. 58 inches. Yeah, so dramatically. Oof. And that would be enough for somebody to take that shot and say, wow, I missed way off. I must have screwed up my wind call horribly. Well, then they start making adjustments. And then they start making other adjustments that they shouldn't be making. Just re, you know, fix your rifle cant. 
Oh, that does make me wonder how many errant adjustments I've made just off of like, oh, I shot a hit low right, you know, like, okay, I'm yeah. going to go. And realistically, it just very well may have been me canting the rifle off to the right. Doing training classes, I watch people all the time where I'll be on the spotting scope watching them shoot and I'll see him hit off to the right and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I screwed up your wind call. I'll give it a little bit more wind and then they'll hit way off the other side. And then I'll look away from the spotting scope and watch them actually shoot and they're just canting the hell out of their rifle. And they just, uh. it just don't know the importance of it. So they do it and not think about it. But once you know the importance of it, it kind of stays in the back of your mind yeah yeah I, i'm gonna i'm actually glad that uh i was here unfortunately our, our dear friend mark <laughs> who's normally next to me isn't here he'd probably find this just as interesting uh but yeah i'm glad we had this one because now i'm gonna take a lot of information away from that <laughs> Uh, to be honest with you, but uh, we will also post up on Instagram uh, these charts that Nick has made yeah. up. And as usual, too, you can always hit us up with questions or Nick himself as well. Nick, what's your uh, Instagram handle? Uh, it's just nick.loffenberg. Nick.loffenberg. Pretty right. easy one. <laughs> oh, that is pretty easy to remember. Yeah. yeah, people can hit you up there, too. Um, sweet. Any last things on this, though? Um, you know, I don't think I have a lot more to cover on this. The only other thing I would say reverting back to where we were talking about the rifleman's rule and the improved rifleman's rule is that both of those still have errors. Um, you know, just looking at – you're looking at like an 800-yard target doing a 30-degree uh, angle. Um, six to, uh, six to, I'm sorry, 6% six of error using the rifleman's rule and only um, – Two percent using the improved rifleman's rule, but if you want to get really accurate, take that line of sight distance, take your angle, and put it into a ballistic calculator. Because right, that's going to be your best bet. <laughs> that's the funny thing is, yeah, yeah people get you still real have bent the ballistic calculator to use. Just use it. <laughs> it is, it is. People get real bent out of shape about little things like that when you know just plug it into a ballistic yeah, calc. It's the best way to do it, and it is cool. Fantastic information. I just. I, I'm stoked about this. Thank you, Nick, for joining no us. Uh, yeah, as always, keep hitting us up with more ideas, folks, out there uh, for more 10-minute talks and full-length episodes, too. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.